Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another video. What a week we had last week. Incredible. Uh, you know, too much to talk about, too much to have analysis on. But we have Steve uh, from the Bull of Wall Street joining us today. He's a man whose channel has been absolutely rocking a fellow Canadian. And he's bringing so much value to his viewers and subscribers in educating the retail investors as well. I mean, we were having a very good chat before coming live as well. Steve, a very warm welcome to you and a good evening. Thanks for having me, guys. Hammy on the West Coast. Good afternoon. How's it going? Good afternoon. Doing uh, good. We, wow. I, have to, I have to say, we had seriously missed that bright orange wall behind you. I, I was tempted to uh, stick the laptop right up against it, but <laughs> unfortunately, all my video equipment's at my dad's and I got stuck in a meeting this afternoon. So here we are. <laughs> That's okay. We're used to the orange wall. I'm sure it's yeah. okay. It's actually not so, guys. <laughs> oh, is it not orange? Right. So I, 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 oh, okay. So yeah. I thought I've gone colorblind, but I'm still okay. So guys, uh, it was an incredible week last week. And uh, just let's set one thing clear, that we did not experience any market crash. A market crash, Steve, we were talking to Amy behind before coming live. Market crash is one that we experienced during the 1920s, and it took us about 25 years to recover from. So if you had lost your money and you bought stocks during the height in the 1920s, it would have taken you 25 years just to break even again and make money at top. So I'm sure that's not something we experienced early in the week. We had, let me be precise, I'm a bit of a nerd in the numbers. Dow Jones Industrial lost about 1.4%. S&P 500 lost 2.4%. And NASDAQ lost 4.9% in one week. Wow. What a market crash. We lost about 5% on a NASDAQ that's gone up doubled in the last 12 months. And they call it a market crash. Now, believe me, let me tell you honestly, and I think you guys can correct me. Um, I don't like clickbait um, topics and I don't like, um, you know, causing fear among the retail investors because that's very unfair to do so. Though it was not even close to a correction. Correction is usually between 10 to 20% and that was not even a correction. It was only a 5% drop and volatility is part of the market. So let me explain what happened. So the entire V-shaped recovery of the economy and the financial markets was built upon low yield and low interest rates. Now, of course, that means lower cost of credit and lower inflation expected. Now, we know that yields have been going up, meaning the economic growth is going to be accelerating, which is a good thing, but that means high interest rates. So the market has been counting in a high interest rate by the Fed in the next year, which means higher cost of capital and, of course, higher inflation, which would then eat into the earnings of these companies. And that really shook the market last week because the market was expecting and was throwing a tantrum like a little baby that the Fed might raise the interest rate earlier than it was supposed to. But then we had Jay Powell, um, Uncle Jay, going on and saying that, no, that's not what we're going to do because the Federal Reserve and the Treasury was made to support the economy and we are still far away from full employment. Now, what is going to happen? So that was what happened. And now we're seeing uh, the yields are coming down, the markets are going back up. So everything's going back to normal how they should be playing because on, on Friday, we had the bond market selling off and the equity market selling off, which is not how they're supposed to behave. The bond market usually behaves in the opposite direction of the equity market. But again, that is what happens when you have too much liquid in the market. In, in the market. But my expectation is for the next two, three months, we could see some irrationality in the market and volatility as a result of that. Why? Because, the, you know, because of the... Um, tantrum that the market is throwing, that the Feds might increase interest rate earlier than they should. But Jeremy Powell, we have Kishkawi speaking this week as well. Many of the Feds are going to be talking this week, reinforcing, reiterating that they're not going to be inter increasing interest rate. And I think they should stick with that because once we stick with that, the market would settle down and the yields will come back down and everything will go back to normal. So my expectation is we will see some volatility, no correction, no market crash, but just volatility for the next couple of weeks until we see Q3, uh, Q1 earnings in March by these bigger um, macro caps, large caps, and then things should go back to normal. But again, volatility is part of the market, but don't be fooled, this was no correction or market crash at all. Now, I'll give it back to Steve. I spoke too much about the economy, and that was my opinion. I sort of went through it quickly. But Steve, how do you see the markets, especially in the micro cap space? Uh, recently in the last week, I've been kind of looking into this as I am new to the market in 2020. And I found mm -hmm. that a lot of it ties into new investors and not being prepared or educated for what can come. You know, these mm -hmm. little pullbacks in the market are healthy, but I'm also experiencing a shift. I've noticed a shift of sectors with the big money myself, a little bit more towards the financial, the energy, 
and even commodities a little bit. So I've just noticed on my end and through the viewers, it uh, road, and like you said, the, the market's throwing a tantrum. Mm -hmm. Sorry, we lost you momentarily, Steve, but you're back on. Okay, and the market was just throwing a tantrum there, I think. We just need to be educated as investors as to what's normal, what we can expect, and, and just keep an eye on things for our investments. Brilliant. Hammy, what yeah, do you I think, think of last, the market? Well, I think last week just showed us, you know, what we've been preaching for the last, you know, however, you know, a couple months is, you know, you got to have a cash position to take advantage of, of things like this because the market's not going to always go up it's not going to keep going up constantly there's going to be times when they need to shake the tree and um get some some of that money out of the hands of the retail and back into <laughs> to the funds i mean that's just that's the game that's the manipulation that that's played right so um yeah i think last week you know it was just a reminder you know we get caught up in in watching the markets go and go and go thinking it's never going to stop and then all of a sudden oops um you know we get a little bit of a pullback uh, and then you're wishing that you had had cash on hand to buy some of the the deals that uh, that are out there on some of the stocks that we love. So I think you know it's, it's just a typical thing. Like we haven't seen one for a little bit. I, I, although I do think we had something similar closer to the end of January as well. Um, but yeah. Oh, so we I saw think, two. Yeah, we saw two major market drops. Um, yeah. You know, of volatility towards the end of November. So I think from November, from September second to November nineteenth, I was going through the charts. The market actually, you know, didn't recover. So you had you bought stocks in September second, you were only broken even on November nineteenth. So how can no one panic then? Because you know, people were still in in the delusion that we're still going through the whole thing and you know the recovery of the pandemic. But now eyes are sort of opening, um, at least in my opinion. Yeah, for sure. And you know, with all this liquidity, like you said, you know, a, a good part of it is coming from newer investors and retail investors and you know who, who are the ones with the weak, weakest hands it's it's the ones that can't afford to lose um so you know you, you see markets starting to go down you start pulling your money out and it's just a big chain reaction then you see mm. that you're green and something on your portfolio so you pull out of that one that's green and then try and buy something low and it just causes this like mass <laughs> reaction so uh you know at least friday we saw some stability come back um so I'm thinking, you know, this week we could, you know, see some more stability and getting back to like a normal trading kind of uh, curve mm -hmm. here. One thing see, I have noticed think? with the market as well, yeah. though, is the hysteria. It seems that mm -hmm. a lot of the young investors have a mindset of 200 percent mm -hmm. gains in a week. <laughs> and just being used to that in 2020, I found it like a hysteria, yeah. like they have to get it yeah. every week. Whereas, you know, in these situations in the pullbacks, you can add conviction stocks so mm. that's one thing i've noticed is the hype with the game yeah well that's the, that's the thing like everyone's kind of used to these big big gains but i mean you know sure there's people that are, are nailing those gains but there's people that are stuck and, and losing on the way back down so i mean there's a lot of a lot of the sheep to you know for lack of a better term that get stuck with that like you look at gme like who is buying at 400 dollars? i mean they're not going to get that money back um no. so I mean, yeah, that's why we be, that's why we have to be careful, and that's why you know you know we we try to pick strong fundamental companies because they don't really they move with the market. They don't move beyond what the market's doing. So um, obviously, we saw some of the stocks that we we follow that had big runs that you know fell back a little bit more. But um, all in all, you know the ones that have fundamentally strong uh, backbones will uh, recover faster. I think. Yeah, and um, I'll just go through my notes. Um, you know, if, if people go through our videos, um, I think we actually predicted some market volatility for the month of February and March, back in December. I remember in one of our videos, we said, you know, expect some market volatility in, in February and March because those are usually historically talking, uh, speaking, you know, the, mar the, the months that everything's coming to, a, you know, is cooling off. Um, those big hedge funds have already made their profits during Santa Claus Valley and everything is calming down. Everyone is expecting for March to get the Q1 earning results. So I think we sort of predicted that. And, you know, it's, it's not that we are fortune tellers, but it's, you know, if you've been in the market for a few years, you can actually see the trends and things are not as, you know, as foggy as it might sound. Now, also, um, it's so funny because at the beginning of the pandemic, I think it was around June or July when the market was not to where it is today, I made an early video about how to navigate the market volatility. And I used the example of someone who's in a coma. So the Fed had 
you know, put the entire economy in a coma because, you know, the economy was sick, unemployment was 80%, everyone was sitting at home. So we had that induced coma of the economy to make sure everything can go back to normal. But we really could see that if that person in coma or that economy that was in, put, put an in, induced coma was to come out of this coma and open its eyes into reality, as we're seeing today, now vaccine is rolling out, stimulus check is coming back, the opening of the re reopening of the economy, everything's going back to normal. So we're going to see inflation, we're going to see increase, increase in interest rates and yields. And that's exactly what they should have avoided. And we could see that coming because if someone goes in coma for a few years and they want to get out of the coma or wake up out of it, the doctor usually advised that they should not be exposed to news or reality because they could go in a shock attack. They don't know what's happening. And that's precisely what's been happening with the economy. The economy has been an induced coma. They just opened up its eyes in 2021. Well, 2020 passed. The economy survived, the society survived, unemployment is not 80%, but rather 20%. We're getting a ton of stimulus check so we can navigate and go forward as well. Now we're opening our eyes to a threat of inflation and interest rate, which really caused a panic as we saw last week. But again, just temporarily. And I really want our viewers to understand, you know, um, in the stock fam, what we're trying to do is to bring companies that have great potentials, like the likes of Apple and Tesla, they have great um, balance sheet. They can navigate the, during these hard times. They know what to do. They're strong companies that belong to the future. And Hemi has this quote. I think he trademarked it, so I, I can't really steal it. He said, you know, the future of EV is EV market isn't cancelled. The healthcare industry isn't cancelled. Everything is going to be carrying forward. So nothing has changed and we can, you know, they're going to be there. It's just a market, short-term market volatility that we see. So, Steve, how do you see the future of the market? We talked about, you know, this short-term volatility and the tantrum. But what are the sectors and the trends that you think would be the winner ones in 2021? Uh, 2021, myself, I'm a big fan of the renewable energies. Uh, I've, mm -hmm. on my channel, we've talked about stocks like, green lane renewables, for example, renewable natural gas. Uh, big thing for that is just the catalyst for the countries, companies announcing their net zero targets by 2030. So any kind of renewable energies coming into that way, I feel is the future. I'm also big on telehealth. As if you follow the World Health Organization like myself, you'll know that they're stipulating guidelines now for the future to prevent these sort of pandemics from happening again. So through that ties into the doctor's office, uh, pharmacies, not having sick people in walking around with other people. So it all ties in through, and obviously the convenience of it, you can sit in your house and have your doctor appointment and have your pharmacy, you know, have the pharmaceuticals delivered. So renewable energies, telehealth, I think they're big going forward myself. Tommy, what do you think? Yeah, I agree. I think renewable energy is a really hot, hot thing right now with sustainability and ESG. Um, I think those are going to be really big themes uh, this year as well. And, you know, Green Lane is one that, you know, we've, you know, I've been following for a while and I, I really like what they're doing. Um, and I think there's going to be a lot of other companies that are doing a lot of great things coming up as well. Um, <clears throat> then you look into telehealth and just the health sector in general. I think people, you know, with telehealth are going to be monitoring their health even closer. Um, and, you know, in the best way to do that is through telehealth. Like you can, I think I've talked to my doctor more times in the past six months than I've talked to her in my entire life. So, I mean, it's just, it's convenient. Uh, you can keep up with your health. And I think, you know, people are going to be more health conscious. And I think governments in general are going to be building more infrastructure uh, to, to, to aid with that, because I think uh, it, it's important that uh, we have the infrastructure in place to be able to, to deal with these uh, things if, if they come up again. So I think that's where we're going to see see uh things go and with infrastructure obviously we know materials and and all that are required and we're seeing a, a huge demand for um, materials like copper nickel lithium and all that kind of stuff so uh that's another sector that uh you know rare earths and all that that are um, really exciting this year as well yeah i think um i mean we have a pick that i think steve is also interested in and that is sx st george's mining yeah uh, steve what do you think of st george's mining we think it's an I, incredible pick. I'm not just oh, to say I, because we still have <laughs> Yeah, I mean, they have a lot going on for both now and future, right? And tying into EV, I'm big on that myself going forward for the commodities. I mean, uh, just to pull some numbers up, you know, we've seen China right now. They've got huge demand. They're taking over 50% of the cement, 56% uh, nickel, 50% coal, 50% copper, 50% steel. 47% aluminum of the earth's demand right now. So 
I'm big on commodities going forward as well, but tied to the EV is the charging. Also smart cities, the smart buildings. There's going to be a lot of copper that's involved in this when you look at the numbers. I mean, your typical vehicle is 18 to 49 pounds of copper. And then you get into a battery electric, it's up to 183 pounds of copper in that vehicle. So I can see a huge influx coming for commodities just based on mm -hmm. that industry alone. Yeah, I think copper is just at the starting point. I think it's just going to continue to explode. I think, you know, it's it's so it's such a needed commodity with, with all this technology and everything moving forward. And then we talk about SX and, and lithium. Lithium is, you know, one of the most, one of the more abundant um, of the, you know, materials that, that are being used. However, the, the problem with lithium is to extract it is incredibly toxic to the environment. So what, what I like about SX is it's environmentally friendly form of, of extraction. Like th there's no problem getting enough lithium to, to do what we need to do. The problem is getting enough lithium that's not toxic to the environment. So when you look at SX, they have the technology not only for the battery recycling, uh, but then the extraction of the lithium, which is very important. And I think we need more of that because a lot of these companies that are going to be building these batteries need to show some form of sustainability and ESG um, you know, governance um, mm -hmm. for how they're obtaining these um, materials. So I think you know that is a big key to why I, I also like SX as, um, moving forward. Yeah, SX is, um, I think March is going to be a massive month for St. George's Mining because the results came out and they leached um, all these batteries to 99% purity. I'm not sure if you read the reports, but that's incredible. And also we had Frank on, on, on our Discord as well, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, and he was answering some questions and he said, um, I asked about the acid that they used to leach all these batteries. So what happens after that? Are they environmentally friendly? What is going to, add, what's going to happen when we dispose of these acid and materials used to recycle these batteries? And he said they're going to be used and disposed of in the most environmental manner. And I think they're going to be used as fertilizers. That's what he said, which is incredible. So if you can use the acid that's leached the batteries, and in the result, uh, did we lose Steve? Steve, can you hear us? Steve is frozen. <laughs> oh, jeez. Oh, we lost Steve. Oh, oh Steve, you're back. You yes. So yeah, I don't say, know what's so going on. <laughs> the internet is a bit, um, you know, up and down. So um, on, on the report that came out in the month of February, they said that they are aggregating, um, they're in talk with an aggregator to get the Model S and Model X and also um, Chevy Bolt so they can work on leaching those batteries. And they said we're going to work on the feasibility in the month of March and also scalability, which is incredible. So in one month, they can assess to see how if they can leach all these batteries Model S and Model 3 and Chevy Bolt and what that, what's that, why that's important. I actually shared a post on Discord and that's important because all these bat vehicles use different composition or chemistries in the batteries. So I think Model S uses a more nickel heavy uh, battery, more cobalt heavy and the Model 3 now, it's, which is uh, the battery has been manufactured by cattle, CATO as of China, is more manganese based. So it's not lithium based. So if they can actually recycle these two different chemistries, which are going to be the major a part of the electric vehicle industry in the future, that's massive. So they can get the feasibility and scalability in one month. And I cannot imagine what that would do in terms of getting a spotlight for St. George, especially with um, Paul Junior Pelosi uh, at the Rome. Well, that's huge for time frame for them, mm. especially given the market. Like these batteries, you're talking seven to 10 year lifespan. So a lot mm. of them are coming up to that due course time from when it started, right? So that's a yeah. big first to market right there for St. George's. Yeah. Yeah, and even you know, John from PBX has said that you know a bunch of their Teslas are coming up, you know, financing leases ending, you know, <laughs> August. So he mentioned that in his last video that they have. Uh, so I mean, yeah, the EVs were, there's going to need to be recycling for these things pretty quick because they're mm. you know, coming to the end of life. So we got we got to get this sorted out. And not just to not to forget that Hyundai um, actually had to recall eighty five thousand vehicles across the world from North America to India to Korea and uh, they had to replace the entire battery. So we have 85,000 battery packs for 85,000 vehicles. The batteries need to be recycled. I mean, they're not going to be dumped in the middle of nowhere. They have to be <laughs> recycled sometime soon. So all of that has been accumulating for the last couple of years. And this is a great opportunity for St. George's if they can pull some strings and get a few contracts here and there. 
you know, especially with Biden administration saying that the entire, you know, government vehicle, um, yeah, entire vehicle um, thing has to be um, electric. So they're electrifying the government as well. Just imagine the opportunities out there, especially with Paul Jr. being at the realm of the company. Phenomenal. I, I cannot wait for it. What other companies are you guys interested in? Let's have a friendly conversation, especially I know Steve is very interested in commodities. Uh, Steve, what are the other companies that you know, you're know you interested in? You really think they will have a great future with this commodity boom that we're seeing due to electrification? Well, for me right now, I'm I'm diving deep, but I want to kind of present why I think the bull case actually as I've been doing a lot of research the last week into the commodity. And just Steve, we are losing you. And we'll take on directly the challenges posed by our pro We're losing Steve here. Spirit. Steve, we're losing you. Good. Um, we can, yeah. Now, now is much better. Oh, Steve, we lost. <laughs> he's going to join again. I think he just went to. He left, and he, he's going to join us again. Yeah. I mean, the commodity boom is a thing. I mean, super cycle is a different thing because I know there's a lot of words thrown out. Super cycle. Super cycle is an extended period of time. So let's say maybe five to ten years of extended demand for all these minerals. That was, that's what we call a super cycle. So we wouldn't know if you're in a super cycle until we hit that five or ten year mark. But we're certainly in a boom market and it's, it's been pulled by significant demand for these new industries and electrification of our industry um, in, industries and economies around the world. No doubt. Well, I, mean. well, I think, you know, you think about the demand on nickel and the demand on copper and, you know, you look at PNR, which is, you know, 10% owned by IDK, that mine's been shut down. So, I mean, for these mines to get back up and rolling again that were shut down or haven't been operating because the price costs, the prices of nickel and copper have been down. Now all of a sudden we get this instant demand for it. Um, you know, yeah, I could definitely see, you know, a long-term demand for, for these materials, especially, um, with how much copper is needed in infrastructure and nickel for EVs, um, I, I, yeah, I think definitely we could see a long-term, um, you know, uh, growth in these commodities for sure. Mm. And you know, the, the last one that we kind of had was with with gold back in 2000 and with the industrialization of China. Um, but now this is this is all driven by technology. I mean, there's a shortage of microchip. Yeah. There's you know, it's um, we're going to need more of this stuff. 5G takes a ton of these, you know, minerals, like just to, to get that going. Um, just everything, the infrastructure that's going to be built over the next, you know, five to 10 years from just from the pandemic. I mean, the, the demand on manganese and steel and all that stuff. Um, I, I completely think that we, we could hit that next, uh, that next long period of time where we, where we need these, these minerals. Mm. So uh, I just had to send the link back to Steve again. Hopefully, um, you know he would um, he would join us. We're still waiting for him. I don't know if you have um, you know his contact details, so you can um, maybe drop him a message. Um, we try to get him back. Um, but yeah, I mean the commodity boom is no doubt. And SX um, SX dropped a little bit last week. Um, obviously, as a result of the whole market that you know came down. I think it was Monday that they released the news um, the report, and he. he it went nuts and bananas. It went to one dollar and eighteen cents. So mm -hmm. you know, you tremendously, and then it pulled back a little bit. And then Friday, you had a very good finish. Um, there was a lot of demand for it towards the last half an hour of the day, uh, which I think is a is a bullish sign uh, because maybe there's some expectation that maybe some developments in the coming um, weeks as well, which is great. Hammy, what do we have any um, any more um, updates? Should we expect anything from all the, any of these companies going into the next week? Well, I think the last couple of weeks of February were kind of slow on on news and development. Mm -hmm. I'm expecting March to really pick pick it up, you know, with um, you know the holiday season kind of officially done. Mm -hmm. Business is really getting back in into the groove of things. Uh, so I would expect you know a lot of our companies that we follow to have you know quite a steady stream of news again back to back to where we were. Um, so. Yeah, for whatever reason, the last couple of weeks of February were pretty slow. But um, you know, I think we got a lot of promising things coming. You know, Skylight Health, 
uh, is getting closer and closer to being up on the NASDAQ peak. Obviously, mm -hmm. is getting closer and closer to being up on NASDAQ. Uh, you know, I think there's a lot of interesting things going on behind, like with um, with IP, Imagine AR, and and, NF, and the whole, you know, what they're doing with sports and, and stuff like that. I think the Valencia, we saw some videos um, of activations with the Valencia project that they're working on. So I'm um, sure we're going to see some more developments there. Um, yeah, I, I could probably talk to every kind of like Loop Insights, uh, MTRX, just mm -hmm. this major world boxing mm -hmm. event. Loop had a great are, week. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're already <laughs> talking about the next events, right? So, I mean, yeah. and this isn't like, this is more of their end game. Like, this is like kind of what they're working towards for fan engagement, wallet pass, and yeah. engaging more fans uh, in general, right? So, this isn't this isn't related necessarily to COVID, but this is you know what their what their end game is and where where they see their technology. Um, you know, I think it's been a bit for AUAG. I, I, I'm almost certain we're going to get something on the tantalum developments uh, this month. Um, but I, I'm, you know, patiently holding that one because I know, you know, they're already distributing manganese and tantalum. So, yeah. uh, I mean, we're basically at bottom in my, in my mind. So, um, yeah. Uh, what else do we got here? I can just pull them well, up. We've got Peak, which is incredible. And we yeah, spoke with Kathy. Massive yeah, month. we spoke with Kathy, and they're going to have a massive month. I mean, March um, and April is going to be such an incredible month for them. You know, you have at the end of March, we're going to see um, NASDAQ up listing, and then hopefully after that, um, we're going to see um, the projections come out. And projections are going to come out, and also the results, the earnings for Q4 are also going to come out. So, you know, good news after good news. They're just, you know, um, I know they're going to beat the estimates. Um, they're going to blow it, and they're going to be massive. So I cannot wait for that. Um, what other companies? Let's, let's talk about... Well, we had John on from PBX on the... Um, oh. Any, of course. Uh, <laughs> <talk> <laughs> this is the cool thing about Clubhouse, right? You you're on there, and then a CEO of a company that you talk about, you know, it just drops by and it goes, yeah, yeah, we have so you, <coughs> we might have a good week next week, and you know, uh, do not know what to say, what else to tell you, but uh, he said that it's going to be a good week. So, um, however you would want to interpret um, that, um, I think it's going to be a good week. Yeah, I, I, for, I, for at least PBX. I mean. <laughs> Uh, peak is going to be good but again you know you can't expect peak the stock to move up every day it's already done a great job in the last couple of months oxygo uh, what's happening with oxygo i mean are we still going through the the warrants yeah i think well i think the warrants are coming to an end but i think we're just waiting for an update on the tantalum shipments and all that mm. to really make sense of that right so uh and maybe an update on how much uh, manganese they shipped in february would be another good update um but yeah like i said i think we're like at the rock bottom for what this company is doing like it's already trading below it's you know minimum market cap for manganese so it's you know i'm patiently oh, it's, it's, i mean investing investing to make money long term you, i mean you got to be patient right um you can try and trade up and down and swing and all that stuff but uh, at the end of the day mm. uh, investing is about being patient so Absolutely. Investing is about patience. If you're not patient, you're going to lose money. So if you want to be a short-term trader, you can be. Fancy Nights had an incredible week. Um, we met with Darius and Scott as well. Um, they've done great, especially with the legalization and the bill going through the through the House of um, Commons. It's going to be phenomenal. Let's talk about win. That's true. Yazan, yeah, just brought up the topic. Let's talk about win. Win is going to be incredible. We talk about commodity boom, but who's going to drive down the costs? and push up efficiency and innovation in the mining sector. And that's one company that's win. And I've been working with Dragonfly, which is obviously a very renowned company. It's doing absolutely incredible. I, uh, I cannot wait for some news release coming out next week, maybe in the, week, in the coming weeks and months, because, you know, the technology that they have, the AI platform they have, they can just lend it to Dragonfly, and the Dragonfly can do whatever they want with that technology. Because it's tech-based, the scalability is limitless incredible yeah there's no other solution like it that combines ai with with drones to be able to scan you know areas of interest for mining like to show where um you know the the most uh 
beneficial spots to, to drill, right? And that saves these companies tons of money. They don't need to dilute their share structure as much to, to be able to, you know, do all this all the drilling. And you talk about the landmines. I mean, it's just an incredible um, operation to uh, be able to decommission landmines all over the world. Um, and, it, and there's nobody else doing it this way. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an incredible opportunity. And I'm, I'm sure we're going to see a lot on that in the next six months or so. Mm. Um, and even Cameron said he doesn't enter into a deal unless uh, unless there's something that, unless there's something there already. So uh, looking mm. forward to that. Yeah, I think I think we'll see further integration and partnership between Dragonfly and and really only makes sense because you know as we talked about it when it comes to the mining sector we're going to have because literally what they do to survey all these mines potential you know mining areas is to use a Cessna 172 with a you know low hour pilot I'm a pilot I'm a private pilot so I know how it works to get hours you have to spend I don't know maybe 250 370 dollars an hour plus fuel just to get you know survey all these landing areas mining areas and then on top of that you have to pay for all these cameras and they're not efficient but you know flights could crash someone could come down i've seen many people have crashed their planes surveying mines in in the west in alberta and in bc as well so what happens is that replacing that with with um um, drones which are low cost low maintenance and you have an ai platform that's very efficient efficient so you have all these junior mining companies growing up in canada especially with that bill um, by the U.S. president to make sure we have a more secure supply chain across North America, especially through rare, with rare earth minerals. And what happens is that you're gonna, they're going to rely more on Canada and you're going to see more mining companies popping up. Now, they want to reduce cost, be more efficient and get the products out there as soon as possible. Who does that? Simple terms. When comes in play, it comes into play. Dragonfly comes into play. They have AI, they have technology. They gave you the most efficient, you know, um, process you can get things out at a fraction of the cost a win-win situation for everyone i couldn't have said it in a more simple term no i agree uh mm. for sure um like wins probably you know one of the one of my favorite ones right now mm. just because it's still at a, a level that's you know pretty much entry at this point but mm. even though it's up you know a couple mm. times since we brought it out i mean it's still I mean, we were slamming our fists on, on MTRX Loop Insights at 40 cents and, you know, it ran up to 280. So uh, it can happen fast and we'll see what happens with wind. Another one, you know, ICANN, Iconic yeah. Brands, cannabis, our cannabis, cannabis play. When we talk about, you know, where, where to invest your money when the markets are volatile and how to ride these waves and all that kind of stuff. You know, a company that's making money and profitable is probably a good start. Um, especially when it's like sitting kind of at value it's not you know it's technically undervalued compared to every every other cannabis play out there and it's doing you know and its last updated was at 47 percent um gross margins which is massive like these these bigger companies struggle to even hit 20 percent mm. uh, and so you know with ICANN it's not a it's not a matter of having these huge costs anymore it's a matter of scaling and you know as they um push out their second machine and meet, start meeting their demands, they're only going to continue to scale and their profitability is only going to go higher. So when you're looking for, you know, kind of a safe haven, so to speak, to, to invest in, you, you look for companies that are making money. Um, when, you, when you're investing in companies that aren't making money, they have a higher chance of, you know, dropping uh, when the market corrects and, and stuff like that. So, you know, when we talk about fundamentals, that's one major fundamental is a company that's making money in a sector where not very many are making money. Because um, then at some point, the, the money is going to filter to the ones that are that are growing and, and scaling and, and making a profit. And ICANN is definitely that, that. Yeah, it's incredible because, you know, cannabis is... Um, I was listening to Ross Gerber as well on, <clears throat> on Twitter. He was in Yahoo News as well. He was saying the opportunity that we have with cannabis sector is very much like EV two years ago. And cannabis is going to be one of the hottest trends, <clears throat> if not the hottest after EVs in 2021 and beyond, because we have the legalization. We have to have, you know, um, I was driving down Ottawa and I was saying, uh, I actually sent you the picture of that uh, cannabis store. You had a massive queue of people just queuing up out there to get these products. Now imagine, you know, if you have these pre roll products that ICANN has. Um, coming out into the thing, into the market. You have these shops that want to be more efficient. Uh, they're going to sell products easier. 
and you know more people are going to be going into the stores because it's much quicker it's much easier and across america imagine nevada and california the you know we were speaking to brad about um vegas and I mean, the whole state of nevada and of course california being the largest cannabis market and they're targeting top of 50 percent gross margin that's incredible. They're not satisfied with 48% uh, of gross margin. They're actually going to go up high around 55%, which is incredible. I mean, to have those high ambitions in a market that's very competitive and maybe margins are very, very low because they're vertically integrated, it allows them to cut the cost down so much and be more efficient. They cultivate, they process, and they sell in terms of marketing. And they've been very laser focused in terms of how they're expanding the business across America. They're not just you know investing in splashing millions of dollars just to expand band you know have market presence for no reason which is remarkable to see we have oh this is this is very interesting from Aleph. i'm huge fans of what you do all you do is win and your strategy has definitely piqued my interest i watch all your videos on repeat and just let them loop back around i don't know what else to say um oh. Alan, i think we have to ride that in gold and just put it up somewhere on the wall behind hammy that's incredible wow. incredible way um please um message me that so i can uh, make a little board and put it a bit behind me it's incredible thank you so much um let's see mess the top i can seems to be gaining attention cannabis is being legalized in, in, in new states virginia is a 16 state to pass legalization yes it's incredible markets um well yeah and i can you know basically it's in the most competitive the biggest market yep. california and nevada yeah the largest cannabis making, market in the world they're making they're making they're profitable and fifty percent. <laughs> I mean, in the in the biggest competitive market yeah. in the space. Uh, so I mean, and, that's you know, tell you something. and you have the likes of Tilray and Aurora who are making you know three hundred, uh, I think around what thirty-seven million dollars they lost last year, and they have a zero, you know, negative um, gross margin. So you know, from a business perspective, <clears throat> would you invest in a losing company? That is a question that you have to ask yourself. Would you invest in a losing company or a company that's advancing, growing faster, while keeping its gross margins high and even increasing them? Uh, oh, we have a very new question. Charlie Garrido, what do you think about the Mexican stock market, Ami? Um, <laughs> Out of your area I, expertise, yeah. I was you. <laughs> Uh yeah, I'm, that's not my not my thing. <laughs> Maybe you can. No, no, yeah. I mean, um, I'm not really educated on the Mexican stock market per se, but I would tell you that um, these developing countries, um, the emerging economies, the stock market in those countries could really advance because, um, you know, the, the, the economy in terms of liquidity, inflation wasn't really harmed or adjusted to the level that we see in North America and Canada and the US or probably Western Europe. So, yeah, I think, you know, emerging economies propose a great value for investment if you're into you know value investment great very great lucrative opportunities out there but i'm not quite sure uh, per se you know when it comes to the mexican stock market now i am interested into the, the mexican stock market <laughs> mr top was saying the win and dragonfly partnership was terrific as well 100 percent look who is here mr dota happy almost monday excited about organic garage with the future of cheese team joining them and otc coming soon you guys fan of it I mean, who's not going to be a fan of it after your write-up? Let's let's get that right first. <laughs> no kidding. After reading that, I don't have enough. Yeah. Clearly. <laughs> so, what do you think about organic garage, Ami? You're the expert on that one. You like um, fake, fake products. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I fake. Think, you know, that's another one. It's like you know, you look at the revenue stream and and all that, and the valuation. You know, they got. It's it's crazy to me where where it trades, but uh, when you add this future of cheese deal, you know vegan cheese, which is very hard to you know um, make and and you know mass produce, um, if they can pull that off and actually mm. find a way to mass produce vegan cheese as a brand, um, now they go away from just being like, you know a grocery kind of brand into being a distributor of. Um, something that you know they could distribute to other grocery chains, right? So, because um, there isn't really, you know, there's no main big manufacturers um, that have, have gotten vegan cheese down, right? So, uh, I think it's a huge opportunity, and I'm really excited to see now. I think the uh, the deal is actually closed now, so maybe we'll start seeing some um, 
some of their plans with what they're going to do with the future of cheese uh, part of their uh, business model. But, you know, the, the grocery chain is making money. It's uh, uh, bordering on profitability. Uh, it's doing, I think it did 32 million or so last year. Um, and its market cap is uh, relatively low compared to that. So uh, I think it's like it's probably one and a half times trading revenues right now. So, well, the market cap is around thirty five dollars, thirty five million. So, yeah, um, so it's you know. right around one times revenue, which is insane. Well, that's a trailing revenue, right? We can't yeah. really value the company based on trailing revenue. So, if you look at twenty twenty three, just apply a normal growth rate of I don't know, even if you apply twenty percent, which is ridiculous, yeah. you can still see it's you know trading probably half half of its uh, its revenue. And they have that partnership with Future of Cheese. I mean, dairy industry is one of those industries that has been left out in terms of you know organic and you know not i don't know fake fake dairy products um if you want to call it um you know uh this really left out that hasn't been uh there's a lot of demand for it because not a lot of companies have really uh you know got into that industry but i think it has a great future as we go through and it was so surprising but you know the demand for all these fake stuff actually skyrocketed during the pandemic which is really which makes no sense because even though they're more expensive but now more demand for healthier lifestyle i don't know there's a there's a reason i think it's the inclination towards a healthy lifestyle might have triggered this demand well i think it's that and you know all these you know producers were shut down you know due to the pandemic like True. a lot of uh, uh, you know poultry processing plants and a lot of kind of stuff were shut down so it put a big constraint on you know the food coming into the into the system so i think you know that was played up um for these companies like uh you know beyond meats and all that kind of stuff so but i think just in in general you know i think when we look at the, the agricultural food chain i think it just makes sense for these to kind of supplement you know um and then if you use the healthy living uh, side of it, it it's definitely going to continue on i think yeah it's incredible one common Tesla is going down in price. It's overvalued. I love the company. <laughs> okay, <laughs> no, but Tesla is a great company. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to debate on if it's overvalued or not. I think it still has a lot of upside, even if you go by the DCF. Um, you know, by 2023 revenue. Uh, Mark, even I'm diversifying my portfolio with SX and AUG thanks to Stockfarm. PKK will be getting added to this week. Exciting times ahead. Again, I mean, look at SX. SX has the feasibility and the scalability in March. They announced it. And they are testing both of them in the month of March. So incredible. So imagine what in March they come out and say one morning. And we know they have the tendency of allowing, you know, issuing this news release after 12 p.m. on the east on the east coast. So if you want to follow SX, make sure you follow the Twitter channel um, and check up on that um, after midnight on the east coast. And then I have AUAG. The warrants have been churned. They're waiting for a news release on the manganese and everything. So it's going to be another great one. And Tantalum. PKK, of course, we have the... Um, Nasdaq uplisting, great exciting time again. I said March is going to be a great and exciting time as well. Let's let's see, go through the question. Um, SX and PBX, PBX, I think, is going to be doing fine again. We had um, John joining us on, on Clubhouse the other night, and he said next week, you know, it's going to be an exciting week. So, uh, you know, we don't have any information that's not public, but you know, you make of <laughs> what, what we heard and what we all said. So um let's see what's happening derek is here uh we don't know wow we had people waiting half an hour before which is incredible let's see um let's go through the news okay do you guys see pbx starting its next leg up soon i mean i'm i'm not a trader so i'm not i'm not, i'm no chart expert i'm just going to leave it to him he's he's an expert in both fields I am far from an expert in charting, uh, but I do believe uh, we see we've seen PBX kind of consolidating a bit in this area, and um, it based on you know we just started a new thing. Conduit's going to be doing uh, weekly charts on Sundays, and uh, according to him, it looks like uh, we're good to go. So he's very well positioned. Yes, very <laughs> well positioned for the next leg up, as uh, as you say. Yeah. Any news on the horizon for CBDT and TSF trade safe coming? CBDT, I mean, they had a, you know, they've been doing very good in the last couple of weeks. I, I mean, think expectations are very high. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, we're working on getting an interview with Steve uh, in the coming weeks. 
couple weeks maybe. Um, just trying to organize the time, so we'll get him on. I think Wayne's coming on next week, uh, next Thursday. So I would imagine, um, you know, based on them asking to be on, that uh, there might be something new to talk about. So stay tuned. Yep. Look at that. Oh, oh let's say let's answer this question. It's been a controversial. Gino Morgado, what's your take about IDK stock price going down all week? They're holding great companies. My I'll let you have a go at it before I have a frustrated take at it. <laughs> mm. uh, my take at it is that the stock is trading and there's people that want to own more of it that uh, know where this is going and uh, will drive it down to find uh, and shake out as many of the weaker hands as possible based mm. on the news that was released. The people that don't really do any of the due diligence and understand what they're holding uh, and the performance in February. So that's my take. And I ran up to you know 2:30 pretty quick, and um, yeah, it was just kind of a perfect storm with the markets the way they were that you know people were going to take profits and all that. Yeah. So I'm not worried about it at all. I mean, if anything, you know, I added some last week uh, on the dips. So you know, <laughs> long term. Okay, I have to put this disclaimer that you know. Oh yeah, not do what you want to do. Uh, yeah, so I mean, the, the Ami said it. I mean, hundred uh, percent. You know, the stock price is the same thing. Would you say the same thing if Tesla stock? You know, Tesla was dropping last week too. Tesla has dropped twenty five percent. Is Tesla still the same country, uh, same company? I believe so. I mean, nothing has changed. Nothing has changed about RGK. Um, even with that, PKK has kept its value. CBDT has gone up astronomically. <laughs> you look at all these companies, SX has gone on and on. So the valuation really speaks for itself. Um, on the um, OG topic, any other topics or partnerships in the works? Where are they going or looking to expand after this? Well, I unfortunately am not an insider. So I don't really know what they're working on. But I mean, if you can think of the possibilities, uh, I would think that they would want to market this to other grocery chains um, as it's, you know, kind of like a, an untapped market. Uh, so I would be looking towards, you know, the future of cheese doing that. Um, yeah, not just, uh, yeah, so let's stay tuned and see what, what they have in store for us. But I think that would be a good, good, good spot for them is to, you know, look to other grocery chains. Like if you look at, you could compare it to Vary, for example, um, they mark it out. And that they, kiosk. That kiosk in Victoria <laughs> that's worth uh, $700 million. Um, you should go and take a video of that kiosk. I, I and should. then we can share it. This is a $700 million kiosk in Victoria. <laughs> we're going to get in trouble. Um, no, but we are we're expressing freedom, our thoughts. Man. It's freedom, freedom of speech. <laughs> uh, opinion only. Um, no, seriously, they're, they're marketing out their products to other grocery chains, and I, I don't see why the future cheese couldn't have that same kind of uh, um, development as well. Yeah. Uh, look at this. Um, the polio staff saying some places are literally out of free meat. <laughs> oh, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not a big you know, meat, but yeah, oh, he was. Afraid, you know, for sure. <laughs> his supply constraint uh, was real. Uh, look at this Zaheen he's actually a very good you know active member of the community he also joins us on Clubhouse allergic to milk proteins which is lactose I believe is it found in cheese casein and way need for vegan cheese that's very true yeah. I mean yeah this is what people don't understand vegan cheese there's a, going to be a huge need for this and it's not an easy yeah. thing to mass produce at, at a cost mm. that people can really afford so I think that we're going to see some very interesting things and and I, I saw some people giving heat to the fact that they paid eleven million dollars or whatever it was for this company, but obviously they're doing that because they see something in it. <laughs> that, eleven that, million dollars, you know, when you compare it to very that one that's worth seven hundred million dollars is is peanuts. I mean, no one should. You uh, pay seven hundred million dollars for a kiosk in Victoria, or eleven million dollars for the future <laughs> of what could be. Well, Hammer, you're gonna get us into trouble, mate. You can't be saying that here. Sorry. <laughs> I'll stop. Uh, you should you should take a video of that, please. I mean, it's public information, right? Just take a video and say, "Would you buy this kiosk for seven hundred million dollars?" It's going to be quite hilarious. Jay Mona, odds of PKK TNT uplist without reverse split odds. Lord Almighty, you have a go at the reverse split discussion. <laughs> I've had so much of this. Does you have go? a go at the. Uh, 
No, it's like, like I don't, if it has an RS or not, I, like the, the goal is to get it to $5 US on NASDAQ so institutions can participate. So whether they do it with an R, a reverse split or not, it doesn't matter. We just want to hit that $5 so that we can get the right people buying the stock. That is, you know, what matters the most. Um, yeah. So there you go. That's my answer. I agree with you. Mike Naronsky, do you think Johnson and JJ will hold off on revised forecasts to coincide, coincide with Oplist? I don't believe his intention is to make it coincide with Oplist, but he's, he's working very hard. I mean, um, I was, you know, we had Kathy on, which she rarely does. I mean, I haven't seen Kathy making any, you know, you know, going on talking to the media, let alone to, you know, people on Clubhouse. <clears throat> but she said, I mean, he's, he's one of the most hardworking CEOs out there, and he's delivered. His execution has been absolutely immaculate. You can see it. He's, you know, spot on. And I'm not worried about it. I mean, he's the thing is that the latest news release and it's a good problem to have. How are you going to put all that all that forecast into, you know, a projection when you don't even know the numbers and you keep having deals coming in? So he wants to make sure he has all the information. Charlie Garrido, what do you think about at and I think at and has to spin off his TV business. They have a TV business, cable TV business. They have to spin that off. Once they spin that off, I think they'll be more lean and then, you know, they can work on the telecommunication 5G. They're behind Verizon, so they can do that. But, you know, um, it's telecommunication is going to be interrupted greatly, especially with Starlink coming in. So, yeah, um, I don't think I'm going to leave my money with at and Loop, Michael Corbyn. Uh, are you related to Jeremy Corbyn, the former leader of the Labour Party in the UK? Let me know. <laughs> uh, Loop. Yeah, we just talked about Loop and, you know, the WBC, the World Boxing um, event they just did this weekend. And, you know, I think, you know, moving forward, they're going to start, I would imagine that they're doing other events. I think it showed up on the wallet pass that they're already advertising for their next event. So uh, I think that's more their end game. Uh, and I think it's going to be a great revenue generator and, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we'll see a lot more of those those deals uh, with fan engagement. Jason asking about Tibix, OTC ticket. I think they're working on that, and uh, Ubert really alluded to that. It was also another comment. Jason, I emailed Tibix about the topic. I was to keep an eye out in the near future. So that speaks volume. OG planned to heat 2025 stores in the $1 billion Ontario market in time. CEO mentioned BC as a target. Direct to consumer vertical is my favorite vertical to watch, though. That's very correct. Yes, 20 to 25 grocery stores, not grocery kiosks. Oh, like full okay. size stores. Yes, they're not kiosks. They're not stores, as we call them. Um, Charlie, do you think inflation will affect the American stock market? And if the answer is yes, what can I do to protect my capital? Well, inflation is goes up, you know, per se, it doesn't. It could ease up into the corporation's earnings, but that could result in increasing interest rate, which would then, you know, increase the discount rate with which analysts, you know, um, do the DCF for discounted cash flow or future cash flow of the companies in present terms. That would push down the valuations. What you can do is. Well, I don't think that's going to happen. But anyways, um, what to do is usually people, the textbook strategies to invest in, you know, inflation proof companies like consumer discretionaries, like utilities. Um, those are sort of the stock. This is not an advice. I'm just telling you the textbook advice um, that is. But I, I don't think that's going to happen. I think we're going to have inflation um, at the next few months. And much thanks to you fellows. You're helping me see the possibility of retirement someday. Yeah, I think you'll have a good retirement. Mr. Top, Kathy did mention during Clubhouse that news should be coming of a PKK that would trigger the share price to increase. That's very true. So Kathy actually said we we expect it very likely that the stock price will actually reach five dollars US, um, and that would eliminate the need for us to do any reverse split. And if it doesn't, then we could explore and look at the options for two to one. But again, um, that's good. Um, any thoughts on FCO and IP? Well, I don't think we are. Focus on FCO, but we talk about IP, of course. Yeah, FCO, don't really follow that one. Um, they had some drill results that we post on Friday. Um, that's all I know about that. Uh, IP, I think we're going to see a lot. I think it's going to have a big march. Uh, I think mm. Alan's been kind of gearing up towards um, a big march. Uh, so let's keep an eye on that. And we've seen Sheldon buying at market like almost every day um, until wow. recently. So. 
And I think Sheldon has been buying win as well. You know, we shared yeah. the results and Sheldon has been buying at, at, the, at the market valuation, which is incredible. It really hints at something. So, Hammy, we get into that one. Uh, unfortunately, um, Steve emailed and said, you know, he has an unstable internet connection and it doesn't really allow him to connect back with us. So, okay. it's very unfortunate to um, not to have him, but um, we can uh, work on his connection and get him back on next time. Yeah, I was excited. Uh, about yeah. That. Yeah, but you know, um, we can hopefully have him next time, and you know, um, it's going to be a great discussion. So, hey, um, last question there, the one about the EU, because I wanted to kind of explain that one a bit. Is there a question? Oh, well, there you go, ZEU. Yeah, ZEU. Um, so we know that it's 30% owned by SX, St. George's Eco Mining. Mm -hmm. um, so for myself personally, my strategy here is because I know SX is you know a great company um, and I'm invested in it for the EV technology, the EV recycling, lithium and all that kind of stuff that I'm covered. Um, I'm basically covered owning ZEU as well because they have 30% yeah. ownership. So for me, I mean, I'm basically getting 30% um, ownership of ZEU um, through owning shares of SX. So I don't necessarily feel like I need to necessarily invest in ZEU as well. Um, but uh, if, if you like the technology and that could be something that, that fits um, your needs, but for myself personally, my strategy is to hmm. um, own more of SX because I, I believe in, in, in that, uh, that side of things and I'm gonna get the 30% ownership of ZEU. Yeah, brilliant. So um, let's look at this. Any hidden gems you guys are working on that aren't part of part of the fam yet? I think if you have any peaks, they'll just be released to the fam. There's no, there's no something hidden. No. Once it's there, it's there. Was that IPKFF? IP. I think so. Huh? FF. Hold on. Why did I not remember this? I'm throwing for. Oh, let me let me search. IPNFF. IPNFF? Yeah. Yes, IPNFF. IPNFF is Imagine AI. Oh, wow. You actually... Okay. Oh, it's, it's the USD. Okay. So let's go through um, the markets. Uh, bonds are down, which is good. Cryptocurrency. Bitcoin is up 4.2%, 46,000 and a half. US dollar is down. Commodities are up. Copper is up 1% again. I really want... The price of copper to start cooling off. Um, I really want to see that. The markets are up. US Dow Jones 0.72% up. Futures uh, for SP 0.84%. NASDAQ 1.17%. And a small cap Russell 2000 1.57% up. Um, Charlie, what will happen when the Fed stops printing the dollars uh, in its tracks? Well, you know, uh, they'll have to stop printing money at some point, but we think there's ample liquidity that will foster economic growth. And as we go back to normal, hopefully economic growth in the economy would push us forward, um, which is great. So, Hami, um, almost the one hour mark. Your final words before we wrap this up. Um, thanks for tuning in. Uh you know, just keep following Stock Fam on YouTube and Discord and Clubhouse, and we're going to keep bringing uh, more and exciting things. We just announced the weekly charts for all of our picks that Candid was nice enough to do. Mm. Um, it's more geared towards uh, long term investing, but uh, it kind of gives you, paints you a picture of where our stocks are, are headed into the future as long as they keep executing. Um, so, yeah, just keep following us and uh, let us know if there's anything you'd like, to, like us to talk about or whatnot yeah yeah absolutely uh, i'm not a good youtuber and promoter of my own channel or the stock farm channel i mean i'm it's very unfortunate but please like the video on either of the channel you are and subscribe to both channels follow us on twitter stock farm and if you want to follow me of course um you can follow me as well i put the ticket down that it's moving around uh spread the word about discord because other places are just too much useless information that really misguides and misleads the you know retail investors if you want to help someone bring them out it's for free that's what we do so it's, uh, it's, it's what we love to do it's our passion and nothing else and i think we've shown that over the past six seven months um anyways guys um thank you so much for tuning in every single one of you uh, we cannot wait for tomorrow. Oh, Clubhouse. We are on Clubhouse, 8.45 a.m. 
Eastern time for pre-market coffee hour. Make sure you tune in. And I hope you feel better than <laughs> his face is showing. Uh, that was not really the best welcoming um, expression. But please join so us. 8.45 a.m. Eastern time, uh, 45 minutes before the market opens. And, you know, join us. And we cannot wait to see you. Really appreciate uh, you guys tuning in. And, yeah, we'll see you all tomorrow morning, 8.45 a.m. Eastern time on Clubhouse. Have a good one, guys. Cheers. Good night.